Yes. Can I ask a, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Uh, it's regarding this uh, principal component analysis. As you say, when the data are uh, not linear, then uh, I mean, I have seen it. my experience is that uh, when when the data are not like that, then we tend to still increase the high dimensionality. So we just try to uh, check with the which polynomial order and then linear combination of that actually works and fit. So how how that is uh, I mean. As per the this curse of dimensionality reductions, that can actually be a very bad idea to do that, but it works time to time in the practical. So what's your experience regarding that? Have you had come across such kind of problems? So you mean, you mean that even though, uh, that, let's see if I understand your question, even though it's not, um, it's theoretically not good to have more dimensions, you mean that sometimes when you do create more dimensions, it's actually good? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, but like you said, in practice, it works from time to time. And the reason I understand, and I, I, I completely agree with you. Like, for example, you may, um, sometimes you may want to do, to do a combination of squares of features. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because then you get like, for example, when you want to, to do like a kernel uh, or something like that. I, I, I understand, but you see, usually you're talking about like heavily customized, manually generated features that you know are probably gonna work. And, and sometimes you, you try like 10 different ones and two of them work and then you throw away the other eight and you use these two because they worked, but this was a manual process. And, and you generated a feature that you like know that works <laughs> in a way, you know what I mean? Uh, so, so you know that these new features are actually better than the previous two ones. So, and, and, you, and the reason you know it is because you have a very good no, uh, domain knowledge and also be, because probably you've tried different combinations and some of them worked and the, the, the ones that didn't work you threw away. So it's, um, so yeah, I just, it's true that you're, you're making the curse of mission melody worse, but at the same time, when you do this have in a heavily manual way by try and error and everything, then I guess it kind of balances out because then in a way, in a way you, you manually did what the computer was trying to do. You know, if you consider that it's just that, well, not with uh, PCA, right? Because with PCA it's linear combination. So then you wouldn't yeah. be able to do like a combination of squares of features. But, uh, but in a way, what you did was you manually did what the computer was trying to do. You're, you're, you're manually looking for combinations of features that are better than the original ones. So, so I, I guess in this case, it's like, yeah, you, you, balance, you balance out the, the problems with the fact that with your domain knowledge, I would, I guess. But of course, uh, always, uh, also, it's a very important caveat here. It's not, that, it's not because we say, you know, curse of dimensionality, so more features are always bad. No, 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 no. Like, no. Uh, uh, dimensionality reduction will not always improve the, the, the results of your classifiers or models because it's not just like, okay, reduce the features perfectly. So, because this, there are so many different methods and the data sets can be so complex that actually you, you can make it worse. You can make it worse because maybe PCA or whatever other method you use to reduce the missionality, maybe it's not uh, good enough for your data. So it actually makes it worse because then you don't, you're, you're losing too, too much of the original patterns uh, of data. So it's not really like, it's not clear cut, like you do it and that's it. Uh, so I, I completely agree with you in that sense. But the, the truth is that when you have raw features, especially when, you, when we're dealing with uh, high dimensional, Daniel, I will answer you just in just a second. Uh, especially when you have high dimensional spaces like images, for example, then the, the fact is that you have so much noise and so much useless features that in those cases, it usually works better. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, Daniel? You had a question, Daniel? Yes, uh, I just want to, to, to hear your take on, because dimensionality reduction is, uh, if you will, 
it's sort of obfuscating your data. You go from features that are sort of natural to the human being, you can explain them, and you can say that this feature one height and, and the weight, they are correlated and we can all understand that. But once you start the dimensionality reduction, you obfuscate them. You say, okay, well, new features or new vectors and we can see patterns, but we can no longer understand them in a natural human way. And I was wondering on your take for the visual analy analytics take is that you as a human should work, work together with the machine and find some things, but this is starting to be very unnatural, but maybe very useful, but how do you balance that? Yeah. Um, here's what I'd say. Uh, so dimensional reduction here, we're treating it as uh, data mining algorithms, right? So it's, um, it's more like um, it exists <laughs> and sometimes it gives good results, uh, but it's uh, really true that it's not easy to interpret. If you have linear uh, projections like this one, for example, because the new axes are linear combinations of the original ones, then you can always extract the, you, you can always go back to the original. So you can, you can always say, okay, this principal component here, this, this direction, it is a specific linear combination of all the previous features that I had before, right? So it's always possible to, to, to let's say, to interpret that as, okay, this, this direction here is 50% of feature one, plus 20% of feature two, plus 18% of feature three. Like what, what exactly you make of that, I don't know, but, but you know that uh, the weights that each feature had the influence on each of the axes, so in the X axis, and then you can do the same for the Y axis, because okay, the Y axis here is 18% of feature one, 35% of feature two, or something like this. So in this case, you can very easily interpret that, well, or at least you have, you have a, a, a fundamental interpretation uh, case here that you can use to somehow you know, go back to your original features. When it comes to nonlinear dimensional reductions, which are, we're gonna see late, uh, next, that's not the case. So in that sense, it's hard for me to give you a concrete answer because interpretation of such uh, algorithms is still, I'd, I'd say, an open challenge. But usually uh, you would have to somehow overlay the algorithm with some other kind of interpretation, usually post hoc in interpretations, which are not perfect, but, um, but they can somehow give you hints on, on what was this, this combination that was done by the algorithm. So like Kumar was saying, sometimes you do it manually. Some, some, sometimes you manually combine features in a nonlinear way. So then if you do that, then you know, because you did it, right? So what the algorithm is doing is trying to do more or less the same thing by nonlinearly combining some features. But then later, it's not that easy to extract what was the, the thing that, that, it, that, that it did. So I guess it's open research challenge and it's hard to say exactly whether the, how do you say that in, in, uh, in English? In Portuguese, we will say that the sauce is more expensive than the actual food. <laughs> so uh, it's hard to, to say whether the algorithm actually helped or it just made things worse. Uh, in that, it's hard to say. I can't really give you a final answer. <laughs> but okay. there, is, there is a lot of research on interpretation of these things. So, so on, on forms or ways to interpret it. And I guess that's, all, that's a very interesting subject also. Now, uh, we're, we're gonna talk about multidimensional scaling, which can or cannot be linear, uh, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamentally different approach than PCA most of the time, which is to forget a little bit about the theory in, the, in a way of, uh, well, this is a theoretically good uh, layout and start going a little bit crazier with the algorithms in order to find more interesting uh, non-linear and complicated combinations of features so that the actual final result represents better 
the complicated patterns that you find on real world data, right? So, so while PCA has this constraint that it has to be this theoretical, it has this theoretical foundation that you cannot break away from, uh, and it has this, this strict interpretation of combining linearly features from the original space into the final one, MDS kind of throws that away a little bit and says, okay, let's just forget about these constraints and let's just optimize a specific cost function and see what, what happens. And um, so basically, basically the idea here is that you have the, the original space and then you have some final space, which is Q dimensional. And the goal of any multidimensional scaling method is to minimize the distance, the difference in the distances between the points in the original space and the final space. So if some points were far away originally, they should be far away in the final output. If some points were originally close to each other, doesn't matter the distance, doesn't matter the dimensionality of the original space, right? Even if it's 100 dimension, dimensional, you can still compute distances. So if they were close together originally, they should be close together in the, in the low dimensional space also. Exactly how you go from this to this, you, everyone, uh, each, each most dimensional scaling method goes crazy on different uh, types of optimization and different cost functions. But the constraint is there. There should be a good relationship, a good, uh, let's say, equivalence in the pairwise distances between points. Points that are not close together, they should not be close together. Points that are close together, they should be close together. Uh, but that's very, very general and can be done in millions of different ways. Uh, so in this case, just so you guys understand, in an MDS, um, in an MDS, uh, sorry, function, you don't, you don't go in with the data anymore. You go in with the distance matrix. So you just compute a pairwise distance matrix n by n, where each cell here is one distance between two points. Like cell, if you take cell one, uh, four, that is the distance between the first point and the fourth point, and so on. So this is this is a quadratic operation of computing this. Then you give this to MDS, and MDS will actually give you the the points. So the same, the output is the same as the previous ones. The, endpoints by Q dimensions, whatever number of dimensions you want. It's just that the input, for the input, MDS doesn't, doesn't really care anymore about whether this input is a, is a Euclidean space or whatever. Anything could go as long as it's, it has distances between points, right? Uh, it, which is interesting because then it, it actually allows you to, for example, use networks or use any other kind of, um, any other kind of data set that has uh, implicit dimension, uh, distances between points. Maybe you have data sets that, has, that have implicit distances between points, but they don't really come from an Euclidean space. Like for example, you can, com you can compute distances between text sentences. So you have two sentences and you can compute a distance between them without actually having any kind of Euclidean space there. And then if you have those distances between all pairs of all sentences, you can feed that into multidimensional scaling and you will get, and the result will be this low dimensional space in whatever dimensionality you want. So for example here, I like this example because again, it's the same one as the correlation between crime rates in the US states. And I said it was um, cities, but it was actually states, sorry. So for example, uh, actually we can start like this. If you look at, uh, if you look at assault, for example, then you say, then you take like number four and number one. They, uh, so the, uh, in the assault, they are very well correlated here. So there are, there are these uh, points. So this is like murder and assault. You see murder is number one and assault is number four. Murder and assault are very much correlated. So 0 uh, 0.81 correlation. So you see they're, they're very close to each other. Assault and rape, they're also like slightly less correlated, but still highly correlated. So assault and rape are connect, are relatively close to each other here. And the same with larceny and burglary, 0 0.8 correlation, they are close to each other. And then you take something like larceny six with, uh, with murder, 
very low correlations. So then you can see that larceny is over here, murder is over here. So if they are very far away in the original space, they should be very far away again in the final space. So that's why they are put so, so far away like this. Same thing with auto theft is not correlated with murder. So you can see that it's all the way to the other side of the layout, right? It's over here while murder is over here. And then for example, you have something like rape, which is not that much correlated with murder, but also not, it's just a, let's say, very average correlation, 0 0.52. Then you can see that they're not like, they're not close to each other too much, but they are also not super far away from each other. They're, they're, kind, of, they're kind of like halfway between the, the in, in the complete space of uh, the two dimensions here, right? So basically that's it. Uh, what you see here should have a good correlation with what you see here so that you, using this, you can interpret actually this one. Close, close points should be close to each other. Far points should be far, far away from each other. The general procedure here, and you will see this with many different algorithms, be them, it, because MDS is not really like, there's MDS, that's it. MDS is like a name that we give to a whole group of possible uh, algorithms that follow more or less this general procedure, usually using gradient descent, but some, some let's say, advanced form of gradient descent. You start with an initial configuration, uh, right? And by configuration, I mean just like one initial thing of this, like this is the final, this is the final result of my optimization. This is optimized, right? This, this makes sense. But in order to get to this place, first I need to start from somewhere. Start from some configuration that I have no idea if it's good or bad. And for example, you can just take the points and just randomly put them into a 2D layout like this, just whatever. I don't, because, since I don't know, I just put them. That's the initial configuration. Then you evaluate a, sh a chosen cost function. So every MDS method has a cost function, something that you're optimizing. And usually this cost function is a comparison between the pairwise distances in the two spaces. Since the, the goal of the MDS is to minimize the difference between these two things, then usually the cost function represents that. We're gonna go back to this in the next couple of slides. If the cost is low enough, or the maximum number of iterations was reached, stop. There will, there will always be cost, like the, the distances will never be perfectly equivalent if you're really going from a high dimension space to a low dimension space. But, but sometimes you, you, you can have this, this uh, threshold of cost, right? That you say, okay, if the cost goes below 0 0.01, then that's good enough for me, so you can stop. Uh, or, if the maximum number of iterations was reached, which is what you're doing in your assignment. So you say, I want 50 iterations. Whatever comes out of that, that's good enough for me. Because it's an, it's an iterative thing, right? The, the idea is that you start from a certain configuration, then you slightly optimize it, and then you slightly optimize it again, and then you slightly optimize it again, and so on and so forth until you get to a certain final result. So, if you didn't stop here, then you move each point slightly according to the learning rate towards the direction where the cost function is minimized. Let's see if I can show you. Yeah, I have a, a, action, an, a graphical representation here. So for example, let's say you're optimizing these points over here. You have, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven points. Uh, you, we have three green points, two blue points, and two red points. So let's say we want the points with the same color to be close to each other, right? So we want a group of blue points, a group of green points, a group of red points. Uh, so right now, what, what I have here is a random thing. I, I just put them there, I didn't care. I just say, okay, let's start from somewhere randomly. Now, let's say I take the, the first step. I evaluated the cost and I said, okay, this is not good because it's random, so I need to optimize it a little bit. So then I find the gradient. What is the gradient? The gradient, the first gradient, is the one, is the, the direction where I should move the point number one so that it would minimize the cost for this thing, right? And this happens to be the direction because one needs to get closer to five and six because five and six are all, all also green, right? So one, one wants to be close to five and six. So this is the gradient, okay? 
Now, I won't move it completely over there because uh, that's not how it works, right? With machine learning, especially when you have this non-linear, non-convex optimization problems, you have to take it one step at a time by going a little bit because we because the, we don't just move towards the final solution. The final solution doesn't exist as a as a clear goal that you just move there and that's it. You take small steps towards the solution slowly uh, in order to converge. So then we have this this learning rate that kind of like limits the the reach of this gradient, right? So then I move one over here. That's the first step. Now let's go to to point number two, right? Point number two is already close to number four by chance, but it's not close enough. So it wants to be closer. So point number two moves a little bit this way and then it moves towards number four. And it's important to remember that in every step there are both attractive and repulsive forces acting on, on each point. So I don't want to just get closer to the points that are cl close to, but I also want to get away from the points that I am not close to. So point number two will not move over here, for example, because this, this would mean that it would be near other points that are not clear close to it. So it will move a little bit closer to, to number four, but also it will stay away from the other points. And so on and so forth, like three, for example, for three is very hard here. The, the optimization of three is a bit hard because it wants to move this way, but it also wants to move this way because it wants to stay away from the other guys. So it's, it's, hard, it's hard for number three to just break through the green points when it comes to the gradient. So actually, let's say this is a representation of what number three would do. Like it would try to move this way, but it would also try to move that way. So then it would end up moving like somewhere over this way. And so on, this will go on, go on, go on, iteration after iteration after iteration until at some point you end up with a good layout where, where similar things are close to each other and, and dissimilar things are far away from each other. So I see this is a highly nonlinear uh, optimization depending on what cost function you're using, right? And the most common one is Kruskal's stress. And, and now you're gonna see that these are very old papers like 64 and 69. This is, these are just uh, like classical multidimensional scaling algorithms, right? Um, nowadays, multidimensional scaling is much more advanced than that. But if I went, if I went uh, to like a recent multidimensional scaling method, first of all, I would have to just start with, I don't know, two hours of background. And actually I wouldn't be able to, to do that, to be completely honest, because it gets super complicated and it's even beyond my own uh, understanding of optimization procedures. So we are sticking to the classical ones because they are, let's say, didactic or pedagogical in a way. They, they, they are the same idea, but in a much simpler way, okay? So cross call stress, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, this is the first MDS method ever um, uh, proposed. And the cost function here, we call it S for, for cross call stress. Uh, it's very simply just the, the if, you, if you look here, you can see that it's the, the distance. This is uh, D is the distance in the low dimension of space and sigma or not sigma, <laughs> delta is the distance in the origin, uh, final, um, sorry, I'm confusing. Okay, D again. D is the distance in the low dimension space <laughs> between points I and J. Delta is the distance in the high dimension space between points I and J. So you see that the cost function here is trying to, to minimize this thing. So it's the I want to minimize the difference between the distances in the final space that I got, like the 2D, minus the, del the distances in the original space that I got. You can, you can ignore this F for now. Because that, if you read the paper, you will see that actually it, it linearly uh, transforms the original distances a little bit uh, for reasons that are not important right now. What matters is that the, the final distance and the original distances, the differences between them should be as low as possible. And this is what is being done here. And it's, and it's normalized 
by the square uh, the squared distances in the final space just for scale okay just because if you don't do this then it goes it becomes like it goes for to between zero to millions and that that doesn't help a little bit too much with the optimization so it scales down by the the scale of the final distances which is dij here that's basically what's doing here okay the cost function is just that i want to minimize the differences between the distances in the final space and the distance in the original space that's what multi-dimensional scaling wants to do now then a guy called Simon came and he proposed something else. He proposed, look, okay, this cost function is not bad, but it's also not perfect. Because actually, this is a very complicated and very difficult optimization process. It's not possible to have a, uh, a perfect representation in low dimensions of high dimension space. So you need a trade-off. You can't just say, I want to do this. I want to have a high dimension space squeezed into a low dimension space such that the distances are the same. You have to give, it, give a little bit of room to the optimization process. You have to, to kind of like let go of some constraints. And, and what someone proposed was that instead of dividing by the low dimensional distances here, equally, and, and this, is, this is an interesting, this, this is a very, very fundamental difference here. This is a constant, right? Every, every distance here is divided by the same thing because this is just a squared sum of all the pairwise distances in the data set. So they're always the same, no matter which point you're, you're, do, you're uh, processing. So what someone uh, came and proposed was, you know what, instead of dividing by this constant thing, we should divide by the actual original distance of the data point. So what happens when we do that? Well, any number that is divided by a small number is larger than the other number that is divided by a large number, right? So if the originally, the large, the distances in the original space were large, then this will mean that this term will shrink. While if the, the original distances here are small, then that term will actually, well, not grow, but will grow more than others. And then basically what, it's, what, he's, what he means by this is, look, if in the original space, if you have points that are very far away from each other, so that their original uh, distances here are large, actually these, they should not have as much of an impact in the optimization as the other points where the original distance was small. Because look, if you're, if you're looking at a data set like this, actually you're more interested in things that are close together than in things that are far away. So if, if things are far away, then just, they're just far away. They're just very, they're just far away from each other. So I shouldn't really worry too much about that because they're not friends, so to speak. <laughs> they're not neighbors. They don't belong in a small cohesive group or they don't even belong in, belong in, the, in the same region of the, of the data set, right? So I shouldn't care too much about them. I should care about those that are very uh, close to each other. So the, the smaller the distance between I and J here, so consider that I and J are any two points from the data set. The smaller the distance here in the original data set, the larger this term will be. So the impact of those two points in the final optimization is larger. And that's what we want because it, uh, finally we want the final uh, optimization to highlight as much as possible cohesive groups of points, Small, uh, groups of points who, that were originally very close to each other. And they're, so they're neighbors, they're friends, let's say. They, they are related to each other and we want them to be very close to each other in the final projection. If some points were very far away from each other, then we just say, okay, they're different. 
I don't know how different they are. I don't know exactly why they're different, but they're just very different. So let's just kind of like not care too much about, about this specific relationship of distance. And this is why this is highly nonlinear because then this really completely distorts the picture that you get from the data uh, in terms of interpretability, in terms of the connection between these two spaces. This, this connection between these two spaces gets very, very confusing. But the final results are usually very good, much better than the original uh, MDS actually, when it comes to investigating cohesive groups of points, clusters, let's say, or patterns that are formed by cohesive points of, uh, cohesive points of the data set, which is usually what we want. Now guys, this is, I'm, this is 1202 right now. Um, I have two or three slides left that I will really, really don't want to discuss because these are related to your weekly exercise. So this, your weekly exercise is the implementation of SAML mapping. So I want to, I would like to go on for just 10 more minutes, okay? So if you could stick around for 10 more minutes, I appreciate that. If not, then you can also read the, uh, watch the video later. Right now, this is salmon stress, and uh, of course, this is just a cost function. So this is not enough for you to actually optimize it, right? You, in order to optimize it, especially using gradient descent, you need actual gradients. So you need the derivatives, right? And um, oh yeah, I was. This is all what I was talking about. I should have put this slide first, right? Um, so this is basically just the same thing that I was talking about, uh, but with some text annotation, so take a look at this later. The gradient descent for this is where it starts to get a little bit complicated because you have the cost function, fine, but in order to actually do the gradient descent, you need the gradients and the gradients based on each uh, point, right? So you have one point and that point needs to be optimized. It's not like you're optimizing the entire layout at the same time. You're optimizing one point at the same time. So you need the gradients for each point to, to move that, you know, as we did this little uh, illustration, you need the, that, that gradient direction that, will, that each point will move towards, right? Uh, how do you get that? Well, this is in the paper. So you don't obviously, <laughs> I will not ask you to uh, extract the derivatives or anything. <laughs> this is in the paper. So um, according to the original classical algorithm, well, this is just a normal gradient descent approach, right? The next position of the point, so point Y, I in, in T plus one, T is like time. So time zero, time one, so one, so, so on and so forth, is simply the current position that it already has minus some learning rate alpha here times the gradient. Right? It's exactly what I showed you in the previous slide. You have the current position, you have a certain gradient direction, but instead of just going all the way that direction, you go a little bit in that direction, depending on this factor here of the uh, learning rate. And, and actually it's interesting that someone calls it the magic factor <laughs> in its paper for some reason, instead of, well, I, I guess at that point they didn't have this terminology of learning rate, but it says, okay, that is a magic factor. And usually this magic factor is 0 0.3 or 0 0.4. Um, and by magic factor, he means the learning rate. Uh, and then, and then the, what he defines as the Delta, which is the, obviously the most important part, which is the gradient, right? The direction is, um, this, this thing here. So it's the derivative, the first derivative divided by the absolute value of the second derivative. And uh, the good thing is that he gives the derivatives in the paper so we can just use them, right? Uh, and this is what they are. Uh, roughly, I'm abusing the notation here a little bit because I'm using vectorized math here, which is not real math. <laughs> it's, it's math when it comes to MATLAB or NumPy, but it's not math when it comes to actually real math. So uh, in the paper, you can, if you want, you just follow the paper because in the paper, he breaks down this processing to two dimensions, uh, you know, X and Y, but I just, I just merge them together here because since it, it's exactly the same, the two gradients for X and Y are exactly the same. 
so then I did it like in a vectorized way where this, these things here are actually two dimensional vectors. Uh, it, it, that just means you repeat the same, exact same thing for the two dimensions, for X and Y, and you do exactly the same computation for, two, for both dimensions and they should work fine. You can even do a loop, like a loop uh, between two, two, uh, two dimensions and, th and then just do exactly the same thing for the two dimensions, it doesn't matter. You just, of course, use the, the X, uh, first use the X coordinate, then use the Y coordinate. Uh, but I just, th so I, I just hope it's, it's not too confusing. But you know what, you can even ignore this and just take the information from the paper itself. It's, it's, it's fine already. It, in, the, in the paper, he doesn't vectorize it. But of course, uh, I like to, <laughs> this is what I add usually when, uh, when there's the assignment, because I say, well, you know what, sometimes when, I, when you start showing some uh, formulas, people just drift away because they think they're never gonna use it. But uh, actually, you would be wrong because you're actually gonna use it in your assignment. And I guess, but this is makes sense more when I present the assignment after the lecture. <laughs> so I should have left the assignments to present after the lecture. So yeah, you're wrong. You will need this actually. Uh, and that's it guys. I will just uh, um, uh, finally finish with this, with this example very quickly because it's very interesting to look at uh, the comparison between PCA, MDS and Salmon in this data set of metagenomics. So it's like genomes of different things, you know, creatures from uh, aquatic uh, environments uh, f or extreme, uh, I guess, living beings or in, in extreme situations, uh, genomes of food or fossil of uh, all kinds of stuff. I don't, I'm not a biologist, so I don't know exactly where these these genomes were taken from, but they're just uh, genomes that you can find in an in a online repository. And when you look at these pictures, it's very interesting to see that the first projection is a PCA projection, right? Uh, and it's very interesting to see how much it's affected by outliers. So since there are some outliers here from the class of virus-enriched metagenomes, uh, they completely, they, they, they split away from the main group of data. So they squeeze all the other points in the top, the top area and you don't see anything, right? You don't really see anything about these guys over here. Simply because PCA is, is optimizing the variance, right? And the variance for these guys over here is, is really large. So, so it doesn't take into account the fact that the whole thing is um, squeezed here and then in, that you cannot see anything. Right. Then you have uh, MDS over here. So with MDS, you see that's super interesting because uh, it's kind of like, it's, it's a much better, first of all, much better visualization. Uh, and you can see that it, it, uh, it kind of like toned down the outliers a little bit because of this, uh, well, complicated nonlinear optimization between the original space and the final space, you, you have the freedom, so to speak a little bit to do that. And you can already, now you can see a little bit more about uh, of this, uh, you know, brownish points over here. They form a, a kind of a structure here. <laughs> uh, the pink ones, they're separated. There's also a very interesting uh, group here of these gray uh, uh, genomes, fossil genomes. They seem to be very different from everyone else. So they, they're just isolated. And so on and so forth. So you can. This is a much better visualization. And then when you when you try uh, when you go for salmon mapping, which is this one, then it becomes even better, right? Um, you can see that. Well, I guess in my opinion, it's even better because you can still see this group of gray points. You can still see the brown ones, and you can see, like for example, this purple uh, points here. They got they broke away from the pink ones. As here, they are kind of like uh, blended with each other. Here. It, separated. Uh, and also you can see that there's this neighborhood accuracy, which is just one, one measure. And salmon is the best one in this case, best, better than MDS and MDS is better than PCA. Uh, and this is just an example of why, of how salmon is better, especially for a visualization, right? And I like the fact that Salmon represents the fact also that the virus enriched metagenomes here are actually outliers. So you can see that they're kind of like split away and, and spread out uh, in some area of the map. While in here, 
you don't see them. They're, they they just got blended in with the data. So it's kind of hard to see the fact that they are actually outliers uh, somehow. Well, you see that in here. So, you know, interpretations, you can interpret things in different ways. Uh, it's not just a final thing, right? And and with that, I, this is 12.11, 12.12 now, and I will let you go um, to have lunch because I also want to have lunch. Guys, I want to thank you very much for coming again, as always. It's a, a real pleasure. And I hope the, the lecture was a little bit informative. Uh, I hope you could uh, have a good feeling of the differences between linear projections and nonlinear projections. So you could see that the nonlinear ones are much more flexible because the, com the optimization process is a little bit more complex. So it kind of has room for more things. and 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 anyway, neither of them are final solutions, okay? Daniel was was arguing that sometimes the actual optimization or the actual results are ha too hard to interpret. So so maybe the cost, so to speak, is not, uh, the trade-off is not, uh, uh, you don't see the value in it. So, some, so in those cases, maybe PCA is the best option. Uh, especially when you're not using it for visualization, but actually as a pre-processing step for applying machine learning, for example. Then in those cases, usually PCA is the solution. So, but this is a trade-off. There is no final solution here. There are different solutions and they all uh, offer you different uh, pros and different cons, okay? But that's it for the nonlinear, for uh, <laughs> the dimensional reduction in general.